So ladies and gentlemen, here we are back at chapter 19, continuing with some qualitative information about thermodynamics. Make sure that you've got some paper, pencil, your periodic table, crappy periodic table I'm going to refer to a few times. And uh, you can have a calculator out, but there's not going to be a lot of calculations in this, but there'll be a lot of qualitative things. So where, are we, where have we been? Where have we been? In this chapter thus far, we've reminded ourselves what delta H stands for. Triangle, remember, means change. H, remember, means enthalpy. Triangle, remember, means change. S, remember, means entropy. So this is enthalpy. I'm not sure if I said that right. And this is entropy. I hope I said that right. Enthalpy, entropy. This is heat at constant pressure. This is disorganization or randomness or disorder of the system. We've been there so far. We looked at both of those as causes for spontaneity of a reaction. And if you forgot, if you forgot in this chapter, we're trying to answer the question, is something spontaneous or not? Is something spontaneous or not? And mathematically, we're going to be able to calculate that, just as you saw uh, in the video cast before this. We looked at calculating delta H, and we looked at calculating delta S, and we're going to combo those two together today, and we're going to talk about how, how we can uh, find those out. So where are we going? Where are we going? First of all, delta H and delta S combine together to answer the question, spontaneous process or not? Spontaneous process or not? Is it going to happen or not? Okay. Secondly, we're going to calculate the combination of S and H together in this new letter called delta G, which is known as the Gibbs free energy. The Gibbs free energy tells us if it's spontaneous or not. Is it a process or not? Thirdly, we're going to look at the temperature and how it affects G, the Gibbs free energy, and whether it's spontaneous or not. And then fourthly, we're going to relate G to the equilibrium constant. Because, of course, back in chapter 15, 16, 17, we looked at whether the reaction lie to the product side or to the reactant side. And G tells us, is it going to move from one side to the other? K tells us, how far does it move from one side to the other? And so they're kind of interrelated, and we're going to take a look at that today as well. So backing up once again, it was some generalizations about entropy, generalizations about S. Make sure you're writing these down. Pause the video now if you need to, to make sure that you've got a pencil and some paper so you can take these notes. Some generalizations about S, and remember S stands for entropy, and entropy, remember, tells us how much randomness or disorder there is in a system. And remember, it's measured in joules per Kelvin. First of all, uh, if we move from a solid or a liquid to a gas, we have an increase in entropy. Second generalization, if we move from a solid to a liquid or solution, we have an increase in entropy, more disorganization, more microstates that those particles can exist in. And thirdly, if we have some gas and we create more gas, like from reactants to products, we're going to increase the entropy because those gas particles can spread out more and have more microstates they could organize themselves around. So, so for example, let's say we have this reaction. This is the Haber process where we have three ammonias going to nitrogen and hydrogen. Notice we have two ammonias right here. And over here we have one mole of nitrogen and three moles of hydrogen. They're all gases. So we're going from two moles of gas to four moles of gas. We'll have more possible arrangements of those molecules, and we'd say that entropy would increase going from left to right. These are some qualitative generalizations about entropy, and I think we did some example problems with this last video cast, but it's good to review that so we know what we're talking about as far as entropy is concerned. Second thing we should review really quick is just some thermodynamics laws. Since this chapter is called thermodynamics, we may as well know the three laws of thermodynamics that it talks about. First law of thermodynamics we learned back in chapter 5. We said that energy is conserved. It means energy is transferred from one thing to another. Sometimes it's transferred from a system to a surroundings, and sometimes the surroundings is just another beaker, flask, ball, molecule, something like that. Second thing says, second law of thermodynamics says that entropy is pretty much always increasing, or at least staying at zero. Disorganization is what's happening all the time. That's pretty much in slang terms what the second law of thermodynamics says. Now, if it's a reversible process at a constant temperature, then we say that ent entropy stays at zero. But generally, we can say that the entropy of the universe is increasing. It tends to increase. Okay. The third law of thermodynamics, maybe we haven't touched on this one yet, but maybe you looked at it in the book, says that 
at zero Kelvin, at zero Kelvin, the entropy of a pure crystalline solid is zero. The entropy of a pure crystalline solid is zero. And this is on page eight, 18 in your text, and I'm just going to show this up to you right here. This is called the third law of thermodynamics. And if you're not used to having your textbook out in front of you, you might want to grab it. It says here that the entropy of a pure crystalline substance at absolute zero is zero. And this is one of the few times that you see entropy zero for anything. This is one of the few times that you see that. You can get it really, really close to zero. This is, in theory, the only real time. And we've never really actually gotten to absolute zero. But as you get closer and closer and closer to absolute zero, and we've gotten within thousandths of a degree, we find that the arrangement and the orderliness of the system becomes greater and greater. So two things were reviewed thus far. First of all, we looked at some generalizations about entropy. What makes it increase? Second of all, we looked at the three laws of thermodynamics. Three laws of thermodynamics. I've got down here to take a look at figure 19.14. This is a graph that just shows, this is a graph that just shows how entropy increases as temperature increases. And you can see that here at zero Kelvin, we'd have zero entropy for whatever system we're at, whatever substance it is, pure crystalline form. And then you can see as the temperature goes up, you can see entropy increases. Then when you melt, it increases dramatically. And of course, the temperature doesn't change at melting. It increases some more. And then at boiling, you can see it shockingly increases compared to melting because, of course, we're going from one of the condensed states, solid or liquid, to a gas. And then it increases more as you increase the temperature further. So generally, uh, as temperature increases, entropy increases because we can increase the disorder or organization of the system. Section 19.4, let's take a look at entropy in reactions. Entropy in reactions. First of all, you can look at the absolute entropy of something and have a value for it. And these values are quantified for us in Appendix C in the back of the book. Appendix C gives us a list of all the absolute entropies of well, not all, of a whole bunch of things. And I just want to throw Appendix C up here for just a second. And you can see that we've got a big listing here of enthalpies right here in kilojoules per mole. I'm just going to zoom in just a little bit. And then you'll see, it just as a forefront here, we've got Gibbs free energy. We'll find that as a standard, has a standard of value as well. And then here's entropy of stuff. And notice this is in joules per mole Kelvin. And you can see that there's never, hardly ever, a zero or anything that even approaches a zero here for absolute entropies. And you can see this goes on for a couple of pages. And you can see there's entropies for all kinds of stuff. One of the cool things that you'll notice is that for substances in their standard elemental form at zero degrees, I'm sorry, at 25 degrees Celsius, uh, 298 Kelvin. If it's a solid, remember it has an enthalpy of formation of zero, and it also has a Gibbs free energy of formation. But the entropy is not zero. You can see that the entropy, standard entropy, is not zero for that substance. So I wanted to show you where those were because we can use those to calculate the entropy change for just about everything. So here's some observations from Appendix C. First of all, pure elements at 25 degrees Celsius, 298K their entropy, their pure entropy, is not zero. Second of all, gases are greater than liquids or solids. The entropy of gases is greater than liquids and solids, the standard entropies, which makes sense. And thirdly, the entropy increases with molar mass. Generally, the bigger they are, the more microstates their atoms can exist in because they have more uh, electrons and, and more protons and more neutrons. So lithium would have less entropy than sodium, than potassium. If you look on the periodic table, those, of course, are in a group right here called the alkali metals. And you can see them right here. Here's lithium, sodium, potassium. And you can see they increase in molar mass as you go down. And then, fortunately, more, more atoms means more entropy. 
more atoms means more entropy. So these are just some standardizations about entropy, observations that you can make by looking at the standard molar entropies in the Appendix C. A lot of people don't want to spend a ton of time looking at them, so I thought I'd outline four things that you can find. How can you find the entropy change in a reaction? Well, it's similar to finding delta H once you know the enthalpies of formation. You can find it from the absolute entropies uh, in, in a particular reaction, too, by taking the sum of the entropies, absolute entropies of the products, minus the sum, and remember this big Greek letter sigma here, right, it means sum, of the entropies, uh, standard entropies of reactants. So it's products minus reactants, and notice this little n right here. This little n right here means the coefficient that's in front of those reactants or products. Remember, we've got to add them together. That's what this symbol means, and then you subtract all of the reactants that are stuck together as well. Okay. Also remember, and this we did talked about earlier, that uh, for for a substance that it's at a constant temperature, at a constant temperature, the uh, absolute entropy is equal to the heat or the energy of that system at constant. Well, it would be the heat at constant pressure, but we're enthalpy divided by the temperature. So if this is true, if this is true, if we wanted to know the entropy of the surroundings. We could say that the surroundings are just like all the air or the world around us. We could say that the entropy of the surroundings could be calculated by taking the negative of, or the, you know, the heat lost by that um, system and divide it by the absolute temperature there as well. So those are two equations to kind of be familiar with and to know that this one right here deals with constant temperature. This one deals with reactions reactions as far as entropy goes. So that's a little background and uh, just a few reminders about entropy. Now let's take a look at the focus question of the entire chapter again and get after it. So is a process spontaneous or not? Is a process spontaneous or not? Will it happen or not? How do we know? Enthalpy and entropy combine to decide. And back in the late 1800s, there was a gentleman named Josilla Wire, jo, 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 Joseph, or they called him Josiah, Willard Gibbs. And he came up with something called Gibbs Free Energy that combined enthalpy and entropy into his world famous equation that says G, Gibbs Free Energy, is equal to H, enthalpy, minus T, the absolute temperature times entropy S right here. You can see this equation, and the gentleman talked about on page 822 of the 10th edition right here. Here's just a little wire, just, just Josiah Willard Gibbs right here. And you can see his free energy equation, G equals H minus TS right here. Well, what is G? G, of course, can also therefore be uh, the change in G if we're looking at the change in enthalpy and the change in entropy. So this is where G, delta G, is called the Gibbs free energy, and it's measured in kilojoules or kilojoules per mole. So what does the Gibbs free energy actually tell us? It tells us if something's spontaneous or not. Here's what it is. If G is negative, it's spontaneous. Spontaneous. The reaction is spontaneous in the forward direction. If G is equal to zero, then we're at equilibrium. We're going a dynamic equilibrium, so we're going forward and backward at the same rate. Okay? And if G is positive, then the reaction is non-spontaneous. Non-spontaneous in the forward direction. And remember, we always talk about the forward direction being left to right in chemistry. Left to right. That's the forward direction. We could say this about a non-spontaneous, a positive delta G. We could say that it's spontaneous in the reverse direction, in the other way, which, would, of course, would be right to left. But remember, we always define the forward direction as being left to right. And calculating the Gibbs free energy tells us whether something is spontaneous or not. And so to answer the question that is like the overarching question of the whole chapter, is a reaction spontaneous or not, G is the answer to that. If we find delta G, we know if it's spontaneous or not. Negative spontaneous, zero at equilibrium. Positive, non-spontaneous. So how do you find it? How do you find G? Well, you can find it just like you did with H and delta H and delta S from Appendix C, because there are free energies of formation, just like there are enthalpies of formation, 
and absolute entropies. And if you look in uh, Appendix C, which I alluded to a little while, a while ago, you can see that there's these delta G's of formation, a little F down here meaning formation, triangle meaning change, and the little circle right up here meaning that it's at standard temperature, 25 degrees Celsius, see it says 25 degrees Celsius, or 298.15 K, same thing. And you'll notice that the standard Gibbs free energy of formations are zero when they're in their uh, elemental states at 25 degrees Celsius, just like enthalpies are. So to find this for a reaction or a process, you can find the Gibbs free energy of a reaction by taking the summation of the Gibbs free energy of formation of products minus the summation of the Gibbs free energy of reactants. And notice there's a little circle for standard conditions, F for formation formed from its elements, N right here meaning the uh, coefficient in front of the reactants or products, and triangle right here meaning change, okay? There's a plethora of examples coming up on the next video cast, so you'll get to see that calculated a whole bunch of times. Well, there's a second way to find delta G, and the second way to find delta G is actually the definition that Josiah Willard Gibbs came up with, is that G is equal to H minus TS. So if you know what H and S are, and you know what temperature is at, you can calculate G. You can calculate G. And remember, the definition of G is that if it's positive, it's non-spontaneous. If it is z at zero, you're at equilibrium. And if it's negative, it's uh, spontaneous in the forward direction. As you can see from this equation, G not only depends on the enthalpy, not only depends on the entropy, but it also depends on temperature, the absolute temperature. And remember, it's got to be measured in kelvins. So how does G depend on this? Well, I'm going to toss in some numbers, and we're going to look through it, and you should be able to solve this in your brain. Not memorize it, be able to solve it in, the, in your brain. This equation should become like second nature to you, that G is equal to H minus TS, and then you should be able to numerically put in values and say, is G going to be positive, zero, or negative? Not necessarily calculated, although we'll do plenty of calculations with it, but you should be able to come through and say positive, negative, or zero. So, in your head, what is G? That's what this part is. In your head, in your head, figure out what is G. First of all, make this table. Put down delta H, delta S, the term negative T delta S. What is delta G? And then if T is, because I'm going to give you some conditions. If T is high or if T is low, you know, if T is 1, really close to absolute 0, if it's 1,000, what is it going to be? So make this little table right now. Pause the video if you need to, because then I'm going to whip through some examples. Okay, let's say that H is a negative number. That means it's exothermic. Let's say that S is a positive number. That means it is becoming more disordered or more rearranged. That means entropy is increasing. Well, we already said that you know, exothermic things are usually spontaneous, and things that get more disordered are usually spontaneous. That would make the negative T delta S term negative, of course, and a negative plus a negative gives you a negative delta G. And it doesn't matter what the temperature is. It doesn't matter what the temperature is, because when you toss it in this equation, if this is negative and you're adding a negative term right here, negative plus a negative is always negative. And so that means that things that are exothermic that are becoming more disorganized are always spontaneous. Always spontaneous. Don't memorize that. Be able to figure it out. Be able to figure it out that if this is negative and this term right here turns out to be negative because S is positive, then you know that G is going to be spontaneous all the time. Okay, secondly, let's say that H is positive. If H is positive right here, that means it's endothermic. Let's say that S is negative. S is negative, meaning it's becoming more organized, more arranged, nicer looking. That means that this term, negative TS, is positive, and it's a positive plus a positive. That means that G is always going to be positive, which means that the reaction or the process is always non-spontaneous. 
always non-spontaneous. And this is true at all temperatures. It doesn't matter what the temperature is. So you can see that if H and S are opposite one another, you're either going to get always spontaneous or always non-spontaneous, depending on what they are. And I always think it's easy to remember this, too, that, hey, if it's exothermic and it's getting more disorganized, sure, it's going to go all the time, always spontaneous. If it's endothermic and it's becoming more arranged, not going to go, not going to go by itself. Okay, you're going to have to put some energy in to make that happen. Okay, more than just activation energy, you're going to have to. Okay, thirdly, now let's look at the tricky ones. Let's say delta H is negative and S is negative. That means it's exothermic and it's negative, so it's becoming more arranged or more organized. Well, what's going to happen? This term right here, then, negative times a negative is going to become positive. So we've got a negative plus a positive. So what is G going to be? What is G going to be? Well, let's toss him some numbers, and let's see what could possibly happen here. So give yourself a little bit of space right here. Let's say that H is negative 100, and let's say that S is negative 10. Okay, I'm going to zoom in on this so then you can see it just a little bit better. Okay, If H is negative 100, I put it in here. If S is negative 10, and I solve for this, at temperature equaling 1, we're one Kelvin, so we're really cold. Okay, now I plug it into this equation: negative 100 minus one for Kelvin, negative 10. So now I've got negative 100 minus a minus 10. Well, it's going to turn out to be negative, right? And if it's a negative delta G, that means it's spontaneous. Okay, and notice it's spontaneous at a low temperature. Spontaneous at a low temperature, temperature of 1 Kelvin, you better say is low, right? Because you can't get much lower than that. Okay? Now let's take a look at what happens if I heat it up a little. Like let's say it's, well, a whopping 10 Kelvin, okay? At 10 Kelvin, I put these numbers in. Negative 100 minus 10 times negative 10. Remember, this is 10 Kelvin now, so it's always positive. A negative times a negative here gives me a positive. So 100 plus 100 negative 100 plus 100, I get 0. Well, when g is equal to 0, what are we at? We're at equilibrium, right? We're at equilibrium. So we heated it up a little bit, and it went from spontaneous to at equilibrium. Well, what happens if I heat it up a little bit more? Like, let's say I go to 100 Kelvin, a whopping 100 Kelvin. Now g is equal to h, negative 100, minus t, 100 um, Kelvin, and negative 10, remember, is what I said, um, and entropy was. Okay, now it's negative 100 plus 100. This gives me positive 900, which means it's non-spontaneous. And notice this is at what we consider to be high temperatures. High temperatures, non-spontaneous at high temperatures.